Welcome back everyone to another lecture. Today's lecture will be produce desserts. The unit code is SITHPAT006. Today we'll be going through all of the lecture slides. So if you feel that you are confused anywhere or you need to revise a section, feel free to come back and re-watch this recording at any time. We will also be going through all the activities. So you're more than welcome to pause as I go through the activities with you and take your time to complete those activities. Once you have completed them, you're more than welcome to come back and resume the lecture as you go through the activities. So let's get on to it. So 1.1, confirm food production requirements from food preparation list and standard recipes. <coughs> so food preparation lists. A food preparation list can provide staff with timings for prep, give an overview of all produce needed on each station, act as an, a glance recipe, uh, make it easier for someone to help or take over, ensure nothing is missed, and provide accountability for the team. Recipes will provide you with a list of equipment needed, an ingredient list, quantities required, the amount of food the recipe will yield, cooking temperatures, cooking times, and a step-by-step -step instructions on how to create and present the dish. When referring to ingredient requirements in a recipe, these can be listed in a variety of ways. So in weight form, so you can have pounds, kilograms, ounces, whatever it might be. In volume, you could use teaspoon, tablespoon, liters, milliliters, um, gallons, or anything like that. As a quantity, it could be jar, can, bottle, box, um, you know, am amount of a certain type of item. To ensure recipes are used successfully within the kitchen, um, always read the entire recipe prior to starting. Cross-reference the recipe amount against the DPS amount. Refer to the recipes throughout the preparation and cooking process. Alright, so activity 1A. List the reasons why a food preparation list is a valuable tool. Okay, so if we're doing a list, we'd want to make sure we jot these points down in that first question there. So a food preparation list makes uh, everybody accountable. They ensure nothing is missed. They make it easier for someone to help or take over the station. It can act as a glance recipe can give an overview of all the produce and items that are needed for each station and provide staff with timings for preparation. List the information that can be found when referring to a recipe. So this is number two. So when we're referring to a recipe, it's going to give us the equipment list, it's going to give us the ingredient list, the quantities required, the amount of food the recipe will yield, the cooking temperatures, cooking times, and step-by-step -step instructions on how to create the dish. Okay, so once you guys have done those, um, come back, unpause the video, and we can move on to the next one. Calculate ingredient amounts according to requirements. So calculating ingredients. You may need to make a smaller batch, make a larger batch, convert from metric to imperial measures, or vice versa. So meaning if you have a recipe that's in a different measurement, you might need to convert. In this case, as we all have smartphones, I would say just Google the conversion um, instead of trying to work it out you know, on a piece of paper. It's much better to Google the conversion and a lot quicker. Amended ingredient to meet dietary requirements. Um, yeah, so if you're using substitutes or if you're exchanging one for the other, then you would also need to measure it out to give the right amount. Uh, scaling is a technique for adjusting ingredient amounts in order to cater for more or less 
people than the recipe serves. To scale a recipe for non-multiple servings, divide each ingredient amount by the number of people the original standard recipe serves and write down what the person um, measure is and multiply the person measure for each ingredient by the number of people you need to serve. So if you think about it, you have let's say 10 liters of um, strawberry milkshake prepared and you need to serve 20 people. So if you have 10 liters roughly 500 milliliters is for each person. So now if uh, let's say 10 people don't attend you would only take out 5 liters of strawberry milkshake from the fridge and serve it to those 10 people. Okay. Reasonable rounding. Some values end up with decimals or fraction amounts. For instance you may decide to use 790 grams of plain flour rather than 787.5 grams. If you are required to round it should be uh, to a reasonable near amount and should be confirmed with the head chef if you are unsure. As sometimes adding a bit, just a little bit of salt more or a little bit of um, you know baking powder might ruin the dish. So you need to be exact where you need to be exact. Alright, so now we get to um, activity 1B. So using the information for the recipe below, calculate the amount of ingredients that would be needed if 10 servings were required. You may use rounding of amounts if necessary. So we've got serves uh, shortbread for four. Uh, for the shortbread um, we've got 225, 175 unsalted butter and 75 grams caster sugar. And we got uh, for topping 150 grams of butter, one can of condensed milk, 100 grams of golden syrup and 350 grams of dark chocolate. So as we have this we could do it two ways but I will tell you the easiest one um, which is divide all of these numbers by 4 and then multiply it by 10 so if we do the calculation um, okay so if we divide 225 by 4 and then and then multiply that by 10 so we're looking at about 562.5 grams of flour that we need in total so we could round up and say that we need 563 grams of flour if we wanted to round up but if we wanted to be exact to the decimal point you could say you need 562.5 grams of flour so we will do the same thing for the unsalted butter we'll have 175 divided by 4 and then multiply that by 10 so we need to have 437.5 grams of unsalted butter then for the caster sugar if we've got 75 grams we divide that by 4 and then multiply that by 10 we need 187.5 grams of caster sugar now for the topping if we follow the same method, we divide 150 by 4 and then multiply that by 10, we need exactly 375 grams of butter. Now in this case we've got one can of condensed milk, so for 10 people we would need two and a half, so 2.5 cans of condensed milk. So for 100 grams of syrup, we divide that by 4 and then multiply that by 10. So we need 250 grams of golden syrup. And lastly, we've got the dark chocolate. So 350 grams of dark chocolate divided by 4 and multiply by 10. So we need 875 grams of dark chocolate. So complete that. Once you've done that, come back and unpause the video and we can move on to the next part. 1.3 Identify and select ingredients from stores according to recipe, quality, freshness and stock rotation requirements. 
Usually when dictating the quality and freshness of ingredients, the deciding factor will be the appearance, the smell, the flavor. Sometimes you could also be dependent on manufacturers' dates of use-by dates or expiration dates and things like that. Okay. Stock rotation, how quickly produce is used within your business will affect what ingredients you order and when. Orders made from patisseries, stocks must be done with consideration of when the seafood uh, will be used and how long it can safely be stored. Okay. Stock date codes. So this is a definition. A use by date identifies date after which the purchased food is no longer considered edible due to health and safety constraints. But this is where the best before date is different so it refers to the date which the produce remains completely saleable and will retain any qualities which is marketed to possess so it could still be uh, edible for the best before date but the use by date means that after that date it is not consumable so you cannot eat it but the best before means essentially at that date it is still at the highest quality but after that it will lose quality but it can still be consumed. Right, rotation labels. Often the labels are colored coded for each day of the week so at a glance they are easy to interpret. So you might have seven different colors for seven days of the week. There are a way of identifying when produce was prepared. Rotation labels help maintain an efficient first in first out system and minimize food wastage. Okay, so we're up to activity 1C. Write down the attributes that may indicate a decline in quality for the following ingredients. Um, butter. So if we're talking about butter, we're really checking for um, the look, we're looking at the smell, and we're also looking at the feel of it. Is it um, solid if it's in the fridge? Um, does it have any you know fungus or mold or anything like that that could indicate that it's been spoiled does the butter look pale and um, whitish in color or grayish in color and not yellow to you know identify that the fat content is rich in that butter or that it's broken down and the proteins um, have essentially separated and come to the top eggs so for eggs if you can't crack them I would suggest you put them in some water and see if they float or they sink um, so if your eggs um, end up floating that means that a, they are spoiled you could also check any date codes that might be on the packaging you could check um, you know how it feels in your hand if it's got any discoloration, things like that. Obviously, once you crack it and you smell it, uh, then you obviously know that it's broken. Uh, sorry, that it's spoiled and you can't consume it. If it's got any um, dark spots or any blood spots, you can't consume it if you are un um, unsure. Uh, milk or cream, you're looking at curds, you're looking at the smell. Um, you know, if it's not liquid, if it's gone, um, if it's lost its water um, if it's gone a bit sour it'll go curdy and the water will rise to the top uh, yeah so smell obviously the taste will not be um, sweet or plain it will be sour for flour you're looking at discoloration so depends on the flour but you're also looking at any mold or any pests um, you could look at the smell does it have a odor uh, for chocolate as long as it's dry it should be fine but um, we're essentially looking for the color we're looking for the density that it kind of holds if there's any mold or uh, the smell is um, odd and obviously we would not consume that cocoa powder you would not want it to obviously have any mold you would want it to have a rich dark brown color smells sweet 
um, but have slight bitter taste. If you've got um, you know a fermentation taste, obviously it's a bit too old or has started but fermenting and going off. In case of dried fruit, we want a really bright color as all of the colors have been um, dehydrated. Um, most of the concentration might be at a darker color. So if it's not um, dark and it is very bright and it may, may have some mold, might be a bit too soft um, in feel and texture, uh, essentially it's gone off or has spoiled. Yeast, if we're looking at yeast, um, we would try and get it started. We would want air bubbles to form if we mix it with some uh, 40 to 45 degree water and some sugar. We want the bubbles to form and start foaming. We obviously want some uh, CO2 and alcoholic smell, a bit of sour smell. And we don't want discoloration, so they range from light nutty brown to grey depending on what type of yeast you've got if you've got active or dried yeast um, you know you don't want it to go dark or dry the drier it will be obviously it, it'll be it'll take longer to activate and old yeast won't activate so if it's not activating that means it's not good to use All right explain the difference between use by dates, best before dates and rotation labels. So like we were talking about before, rotation labels are simple. They're basically color coded labels that signify when they were prepared. Usually you'd have seven different colors to signify every day individually out of the week. For use by dates, um, these are you know put by manufacturers or maybe you um, as you've gotten the delivery you would state a use by date to signify that this item is not consumable or okay to consume after that date now the difference between use by date and best before is the best before date tells you that at that best before date it has the most or the highest quality or the um, I would say the best taste right but after that it's still consumable after that date but it just won't have those qualities that is you know marketed from the manufacturer or that you've stated so it's not necessarily that it is expired it's just not at the highest quality and the last one, what steps would you take with regard to stock rotation to minimize wastage? So in stock rotation, I would follow the first in first out system. I would also take in account what type of stock I'm ordering. Dry goods will obviously last longer than goods that have a lot of moisture as bacteria will start producing in them a lot quicker than drier goods. We'd also need to know, you know, what sort of cooked or raw foods that we're taking um, if they're frozen we can keep them a lot longer but if they are kept in the fridge there's a limit we could also get expiry dates from the manufacturer we could seal them uh, you know whenever we get a newer uh, delivery we would uh, make sure that we label all the new deliveries bring the old stock out and use that first before we ever use the newer deliveries okay so hopefully you guys have completed that part if you haven't take some time complete it come back unpause the video and we can move on to the next one okay 2.1 select type and size of equipment suitable to requirements the so basic equipment includes baking tins and trays cooling racks sieves, mixing bowl, spoons, spatulas, measuring jugs and scales, pallet knives and other knives that you may use in the kitchen. Additional equipment may include piping nozzles, any molds that you'll use to create shapes, cutters, sugar craft tools, wrappers and cases, 
any airbrushing, icing smoother, and veners. Disposable equipment may include greaseproof paper, parchment paper, cling film, plastic piping bags, gloves, foil trays, and skewers. So now we're on to activity 2A. Create an equipment list for each of the following categories. So for basic, we've got, um, you know, you've got your uh, tins, trays, cooling racks, sieves, mixing bowls, spoons, spatulas, measuring jugs and scales, then your knives as well. For equipment, such as additional equipment that are often um, specific for decoration techniques, we've got um, the piping nozzles, molds, cutters, sugar craft tools, wrappers, airbrushing, um, machinery, icing smoother, and veiners. And then we've got disposables. So these are equipment that we um, create desserts with and cannot be reused. So we've got greaseproof paper, parchment paper, cling film, plastic piping bags, gloves, foil trays, and skewers. So safely assemble and ensure cleanliness of equipment before use. Right, so once you've completed that activity, unpause the video and we can move to the next one. So safely assembly practice. To ensure safe assembly and practice of equipment, take care when handling blades and moving parts. Never assemble plugged in equipment. If equipment is faulty, ensure it is clearly labeled. Turn off any equipment when in, uh, not in use. Do not use extensive cables, make sure surface is level. Never use any equipment until you have been trained in its safe use. Equipment should have smooth surfaces, no embossing or coarse surfaces, nozzles and taps that can be taken apart with ease, dismantling procedures for cleaning that require no specialist tools or excessive force, and easy to reach and remove duct panels. Grease filters that can be detached. Adequate space between the wall and mounting shelves. Detachable safety shields. Wheels or casters fixed to equipment so it can be moved easily. Wires, pipes and hosing that can be disconnected. Alright, list precautions that should be taken when using electrical kitchen equipment. So, when we're using electrical kitchen equipment, we want to make sure that we never use any equipment that we have not been trained in. We make sure the surface is level. We make sure that um, we turn off any equipment when we are not using it. If the equipment is faulty, we ensure that we clearly label the faulty equipment and notify our colleagues, managers or supervisors. Never assemble any plugged in equipment that is connected to the electricity and take care when handling blades or moving parts. Now, according to section 3.2.3 .3 of the Food Standards Code, what factors make equipment easier to clean? So in relation to this 3.2.3, .3, it essentially, um, you know, is letting you know that when you are creating a plan for your restaurant or your venue, we need to make sure that it is designed in a way that it can be easily cleaned and maintained. So essentially, you need to have enough space for the equipment, you need to be clean and keep it away from pests, have enough clean water available, have disposable garbage systems, have sufficient lighting and ventilation, have adequate equipment, appropriate um, fittings and fixtures for work, suitable for the business that you're doing, any food that you're selling needs to be suitable um, for that equipment, um, and that those equipments are made out of material that does not contaminate the food. For um, if you're doing like hand basins, you need to have um, a hand washing basin designated for hand washing and you cannot do any 
uh, food preparation and it must have warm running water you must have hand basins near the toilet access to toilet storage areas and things like that if you're using vehicles the vehicle must be able to protect the food from contamination so it should be able to seal itself in a way that allows the food to be protected and be designed and constructed so that any surfaces can be cleaned and sanitized um, when needed so um, once you guys have completed that um, we can move on to the next one so come back and resume the lecture and we can move on okay 2.3 use equipment safely and hygienically according to manufacturer instructions to wash knives safely refrain from putting knives into a sink of soapy water always hold the knife with the blade pointing away from you use a dishcloth to wipe the blade from handle to the tip rinse the knife thoroughly wipe the knife dry and then put the knife away machine guarding equipment that has the potential to cause injury due to moving parts should be used with machine guarding this is usually an attachment uh, to the equipment that prevents limbs or clothing from coming into contact with the moving parts or equipment whilst it is in use to remove items from machinery you need to turn off the machine and unplug it avoid putting your hands into the machinery use tamps or pushes to remove foods stuck in the machinery electrical safety steps to prevent electrocution and electrical fires include ensuring appliance vents are not covered leaving space behind refrigerators not winding cords around appliances routinely defrosting the fridges and freezers and never plugging in appliances with wet hands all right so now we need to outline the process for safely washing knives so we were talking about this just before when we're washing knives we want to refrain from putting the knives into a sink of so um, you know filled with soapy water we want to hold the knife with the blade pointing away from us use a um, you know dishcloth to wipe the blade from the handle to the tip rinse the knife thoroughly wipe the knife dry and put the knife away in a safe place all right what precautions should you take when removing items from machinery so when we're talking about machinery we want to turn off the machine and unplug it avoid putting our hands into the machinery and use tamps or pushes to remove food stuck in the machinery okay what steps can be taken to prevent electrocution and electrical fires so when we're dealing with um, electrical equipment we want to ensure that appliance vents are not covered we want to leave space behind refrigerators not winding cords around appliances routinely defrosting the fridges or freezers and never plugging in appliances with wet hands alright so complete those once you have done that come back and we can move on to the next one 3.1 sort and assemble ingredients according to production sequencing so uh, mise en place where you know essentially it's a French term which literally translates to put in place fundamentally the mise en place technique requires a chef to gather every item needed to complete a recipe and prepare it all accordingly so mise en place technique of assembly does not just refer to ingredients but it also refers to equipment or anything that you may need in place to perform your job um, to a hundred percent sequencing the way in which ingredients are assembled and prepared has to be done with regards to when they will be required the sequencing of production of a meal is important to ensure that it is as fresh as possible and has high visual appeal All right so provide an overview of mise en place 
method of preparation. So, first of all, we want to mention mise en place is a French term, which means set in place. And we essentially, in this term, we categorize the, the method of saying that anything that we need to complete a dish from 0 to 100, meaning from start to finish, needs to be in place. So this could be equipment, any ingredients, any measuring scales, any stove tops, anything that we need in for the recipe to complete from start to finish, we must um, you know, set up before we start cooking um, the dish. Alright, so within our workplace we need to locate a recipe and from it identify all the steps we would take to ensure the mise en place stage of reproduction was complete. So if we're locating a recipe I would essentially um, you know find a recipe um, if we're looking at Ecosh recipes we could talk about the fried rice so for the fried rice equipment we need is a uh, stove top okay so stove top is number one we need a wok so a wok um, and then we need a ladle or a spoon or a flat edge spoon or, or a scraper if you don't have those you could use a spatula we need some oil we need our salts and our sauces then we need all the ingredients so we need to pre-cook our rice we can't just cook our rice when we get an order so we need to pre-boil our um, rice we need to scramble our eggs we need to cut and portion our vegetables that we're going to include in our fried rice if we're going to include any meats we need to chop and marinate those meats if we also need to include any aromatics like a chili or garlic or ginger or any other flavors um, could be that you might be want to you know you might want to use fish sauce or you might want to use some tamarind paste or oyster sauce things like that we want to have um, portioned out already according to the quantity that we need once all of this is done if we get an order the production time will be very quick meaning we can just go from 0 to 100 really quickly and serve the food maybe under 10 minutes to the customer compared to you know waiting half an hour for the rice to cook and then uh, letting it cool down cutting all the veggies this would take time if the customer ordered the dish and then we started doing all this so this would not be efficient for us in a business perspective okay so as I have let, mentioned the recipe and the things that we need for it you could mention that or find another recipe for Ekush or at your workplace and mention all the mise en place that you need. Okay, so complete that and come back when you're ready, unpause the video and we can move on to the next one. 3.2 Weigh and measure wet and dry ingredients according to recipe and quantity of desserts required. So types of measuring and weighing equipment include scales, so this could be electronic or mechanical measuring jugs or measuring spoons. Scales are used for measuring predominantly non-liquid ingredients where the quantity stipulated by the recipe is given as a unit of weight. Uh, units of weight include grams, kilograms, pounds and ounces. To accurately read weighing scales make sure that the scale is set to zero before you begin. Place the ingredient to be measured in the weighing bowl. Continue to do so until the scales display the desired amount. Remove the ingredient from the scale. Wash and dry the weighing bowl or place and clean bowl on the scales, ensuring the scales read zero and weigh the next ingredient and so on and so on. In measuring jugs, when measuring jugs are used to measure out liquid ingredients such as cream, milk, wine, etc. Um, and provide readings in units of volume or capacity as opposed to a weight. So capacity and volume units of measure include millimeters, uh, milliliters, centiliters, liters, fluid ounces. So we don't really use ounces but we're 
we use liters, milliliters, more in Australia. So measuring spoons, many ingredients will call for small quantities of ingredients. These ingredients need to be measured by either using the specified cutlery or by using standardized measuring spoons. Uh, measuring spoons are available in both metric and imperial units for measure and can be used for dry and liquid ingredients. Now conversion, there may be occasions where a recipe calls for a given amount of ingredients in a measure uh, that the equipment in your workplace does not cater for. In order to re remedy this, the values will need to be converted. So if, let's say if you've got a recipe in ounces and you need to convert it into liters, um, I would suggest the best thing is to use your smartphone and Google it. That's probably the quickest way. Or um, in this case, talk to a manager or supervisor or head chef in the kitchen and they can guide you through that. So these are some of the conversions if you want to remember it but it will be hard for you to memorize. So one milliliter is 0 0.035 fluid ounces, one centiliter is 0 0.35 fluid ounces, one liter is 35 fluid ounces. So I would remember that one, 35 fluid ounces is one liter. If you're looking at one gram is 0 0.035 ounces, one kilogram is 35 ounces. So if you're thinking I could remember that one. One kilogram is 35 ounces. Then we'd want milliliters. So 30 milliliters is one fluid ounce. Three centiliters is one fluid ounces or ounce or um, 28 grams is one ounce or one kilogram is 2.2 pounds or 0 0.45 kilogram is one pound. Okay, portions. Where the ingredient amount needs to be adjusted to cater for larger or smaller quantities of people, use the calculation method outlined in section 1.2 to establish how much ingredients will be required. So this is essentially breaking down the recipe. If you've got a quantity for four, you divide that the quantity for four um, by four and then multiply that by maybe, let's say if you have ten people, you divide that by four and then multiply it by ten. So, activity 3B, list the types of measuring and weighing equipment that may be used in a commercial kitchen. So we could use measuring spoons, cups, scales, um, we've got jugs, uh, sp uh, you know, spoons, uh, scales can be gravimetric um, or mechanic uh, mechanical or they can be electrical. Okay. Uh, within your workplace, identify the weighing scales and ensure you know how to use them correctly. So, in our case, we have both. We have electric scales and we have gravimetric or mechanical scales. So, there's a zero dial. So, what you need to mention in this question is that you know where the zero dial is, the zero dial, okay? And you know where the platform is every time you're putting a new ingredient that you're making sure that the hand for the measuring scale is at zero so then you can put a new ingredient and measure because every time you're doing movement it might move for um, electronic you also need to know where the zero button is so instead of a dial it will be a zero button so every time you change between ingredients you want to make sure it's at zero so you get the exact measurement um, depending on what you're measuring you'll need a um, scale that is you know able to measure to the exact amount or to the large amount so some scales might only measure up to one kilo some scales might measure up to 10 kilos some scales measure up to 100 kilos so depending on what you're doing uh, I would suggest that you use the appropriate scale to do so all right so complete those come back resume the lecture and we can move on to the next one 3.3. Minimize waste to maximize profitability of desserts produced. So waste from the kitchen. Steps to take to minimize waste include making sure all staff are trained, inspecting all food orders when they arrive, storing all produce at optimum conditions, only taking what will actually be needed for that service day, ordering produce considering what's in storage so you don't want to be ordering excess and then having you throw it away because they have expired 
making sure serving sizes are consistent, using leftovers, and tracking and analyzing all food waste. To maximize profitability via menu decisions, analyze the food that is left on plates from customers. Consider making portions smaller or offering the same dish in a different size. If a dish is not selling as well as anticipated, create a special dish. Consider offering customers the option to take food home. Activity 3C. Discuss steps that can be taken both in the kitchen and from the menu. Decisions to minimize waste and maximize profit in the workplace. So if we're talking about in the kitchen, you know, we need to consider ordering, you know, appropriate amounts of our produce. We don't want to be, um, you know, uh, using um, not enough ingredients and ordering too much and then having to throw them away because they've expired. We want to track and analyze all food waste. We want to try and use any leftovers that may uh, have been created. We may try and decreasing serving sizes if people are not able to consume the previous size that we've sold. Uh, making sure all staff are trained properly in ordering and storing and all those proper procedures that need to be done. We also need to inspect all food when they arrive in delivery and storing all produce in the correct places in the correct condition. So you don't want to be storing milk in the dry storage area when it needs to be stored below four degrees in the fridge. Okay, otherwise it's going to get spoiled and you will have um, wastage on your hands which is lost to the company. Now in case of menu decisions, you want to be considering um, how do we you know, lose less money or at least um, have zero waste. So meaning we want to consider offering customers to option to take food home. We want them to, you know, maybe if an item is not selling well, we can create specials for them um, so that we can sell those items off quicker and that we don't have to waste and throw them away. We also need to consider making portions smaller and this could allow you to make them a bit cheaper as well. And then analyze any food that is left on the plates for customers and see what is wrong with it. And if the item doesn't work, we should take it off the menu ultimately. So if it's not popular, there's no point keeping it. Alright, so complete that and we will move on to the next one. So come back when you're ready, unpause and we can move on to the next one. So 4.1, following standard recipes, produce desserts using cookery methods to achieve desired product characteristics. So cookery and production methods. Methods for cooking desserts include adding fats and liquids to dry ingredients, baking, chilling and freezing, flambéing, poaching, um, reducing, using molds, steaming, stewing, stirring and aerating, using batter, sifting, whisking, folding, piping and spreading. So create a list of cookery methods and preparation techniques that can be undertaken in order to produce desserts. So we have the large amount of methods that are there. I would want you to include 10. So pick 10 methods from there. So you could use baking, chilling, freezing, flambéing, poaching, reducing, steaming, stewing, sifting, whisking, um, folding, spreading, piping. There's so many. So just include at least 10 items there and then we can move on to the next one. So include 10 uh, different cookery methods and we can move on to the next one. So come back and pause the video and we can continue on. 4.2 Follow special dietary recipes to produce desserts for those with special dietary requirements. So dietary requirements can include low fat, fat or fat free, low carbohydrates or no carbohydrates, low gluten or gluten free, low kilojoule, low sugar or sugar free, 
or diabetic or being vegan, could be halal, could be kosher. There's so many requirements out there now. So you need to be very careful. Fat reduction techniques using low calorie cooking spray instead of oil. Swapping whole milk to skim milk. Serving with fat free fromage sprays or creme fraiche instead of cream. Uh, using vegetable based fats instead of butter. Offering alternative accompaniments, uh, example fruit instead of ice cream. In dessert production, sources of carbohydrates include fruits, milk, grains and chocolates. Substitute for refined sugar include honey, stevia, molasses, maple syrup, coconut, palm sugar and monk fruit. So vegan substitutes for animal based dessert includes margarine or coconut oil instead of butter, eggs or ground flaxseed. Uh, instead of eggs or silken tofu or mashed banana instead of cow's milk we could use rice milk soy milk almond milk or coconut milk and instead of honey we could use agave syrup or maple syrup food allergies when someone has a genuine food allergy eating that particular food will trigger an immune system response and can impact numerous organs in the body Depending on the severity, consumption of the allergen can be fatal. Common allergic reactions include a rash, which is itchy and raised, swelling of the facial features, chest constrictions, wheezing and coughing, runny eyes and or nose, and ultimately anaphylaxis, which is a life-threatening reaction. So you don't want this to be happening. Common allergies include to those eggs or nuts from trees, peanuts, milk, uh, allergies to soy, wheat, fish and selfish. So there's so many out there as well. So I would suggest asking your customers before you create dishes for them if they say that they have allergies. Uh, food intolerances are generally viewed as less severe and usually the symptoms are restricted to the digestive system. In some instances, it is not a food itself, such as bread, um, that causes the intolerance, but rather the component in it, such as wheat or gluten. So common intolerances include histamine, gluten, wheat, lactose or yeast. Failure to meet dietary requirements under the Food Standards Code, retailers and the food service industry have a responsibility to cater to those with allergies. In order to do this, the food serving establishments should have a well implemented allergen management policy, ensuring all staff are trained, relay accurate information about allergen risks, and aid consumers in picking dishes. So in our restaurant, we have a disclaimer straight up in the front of the menu. So when they open up the menu uh, booklet, it asks them that they mu um, you know, must let us know if they have any allergies and if we can um, you know, include any substitutes or remove any items from there that they must request the front of, our, um, front of house staff and they can let the chefs know so we can create the dishes appropriately. So activity 4B, create a list of special dietary requirements that you may need to uh, be required to cater for when producing or serving desserts so let's make a list of maybe five so let's say low fat um, no carbohydrates gluten free um, halal kosher could be um, you know low calorie uh, low salt um, vegan so there's so many okay all right what are the eight most common food allergens so this one's an easy one, we've been talking about it. So we've got eggs, nuts, peanuts, milk, soya, wheat, fish, and shellfish. Okay, so um, yeah, there's so, so many out there. Okay, so include those ones there for that one. All right, how can an establishment ensure they cater for special dietary requirements? So for us, we must be able to cater to people with special dietary requirements 
because of the food standards that are set by our government. Um, so um, if the customer doesn't let us know that they have any food requirements, then we're not in trouble. But if they do let us know and they have told us, okay, we cannot eat shellfish or we can't eat nuts, can you do anything for me? Can you make the item without that? We must try our best. If we can't, we need to give them an alternative item that they can eat. But if we do say yes, we can provide that item and we can cook it without that specific um, ingredient, um, we must try our best to do so. If we um, still don't have the confidence to, we need to apologize to the customer and let them know that there is not a possibility to serve those items to them. But we cannot put their health at risk just to make a few dollars. Okay. Alright, so complete those questions there. Once you've done that, return back to the lecture, unpause it and we can continue on. 4.3 Produce hot and cold sauces to desired consistency and flavour. So a simple chocolate sauce can be made with following ingredients. Dark chocolate, milk, cream, caster sugar and butter. Some common creams and custards include creme fraiche, uh, chantilly cream, creme anglaise, creme brulee, creme caramel, and pot de cream. Uh, flavors for butter may include salted caramel, pumpkin and spice, cinnamon, sugar, maple, and a variety of fruits. Uh, purees are made from fruit that has been cooked and then mashed or blended. Fruit sauces are made by heating fruits and sugar in a pan. Their consistency can be altered by adding water or fruit juice. Coolies is a thicker sauce that is made by passing pureed fruit through a strainer. So when you're sifting um, the liquid, removing um, any of the pulp, so you get a thick sauce and straining out any of the thickness or at least making sure that it is um, thin enough to pass through the strainer but thick enough to still be uh, congeal and thick. All right, fruit syrups are easy to make and are prepared in the ratio of four parts of fruit, two parts sugar and one part water. These ingredients are simmered in a pan for an extended period of time before the fruit is strained out and all is left is the syrup. Sabion or Zablagion um, are interchangeable and names for the same thing really. So it is a mousse like dessert um, of the Italian origin that is made by whisking eggs, sugar and white wine over gently boiling water. Sugar syrups. Basic sugar syrup is created by gently warming sugar and water until all the sugar has dissolved. Sugar syrups can be flavoured in a variety of ways including fruits, herbs, flowers, spices, vegetables such as beets. Alright, create a list of sauces that can be served with desserts. So for this list we've got a large amount of sauces. So we're going for, you know, um, so sauces we're going for, well there's creams and sauces, but you've got your chocolate sauce, um, you've got salted caramel, you know you could have um, your creme um, fraiche, you could say you're doing a chocolate sauce, um, yeah you could do a custard sauce, you could do you know fr fruit purees, you could do your maple syrups, um, you could do um, a coolie, you could do the sabion, there's so many that you could do so just include just maybe make a list of five that you want to include there once you're done come back and we can move on to the next one. Alright 4.4 use thickening agents suitable for sweet sauces so a thickening agent is substance that can be used to alter the thickness of a liquid without drastically changing the taste, color or other attributes. 
If a source does not have the consistency that it was expected to, all is not lost. There is a large range of thickening agents that can be utilized in order to rectify the problem. So we can use starch thickeners which include corn flour, arrowroot or tapioca. Um, we can use protein thickeners such as eggs or gelatin. Other thickeners can include agar agar which is a um, you know, gelatin like substance but made from plants. Pectin or xanthan gum. I, I would recommend using the agar agar, it's just more readily available. Provide an example of thickener for each of the following categories. So starch, we could go for these corn flour, arrowroot and tapioca. If we're going for proteins, we're going for eggs and gelatin. If we're going for other thickeners that are plant-based, we could go for agar agar, pectin or xanthan gum. Alright, so complete those lists, include those thickeners. Once you're done, come back and we can uh, continue on. 4.5. Make food quality adjustments within scope of responsibility. So the scope of responsibility is the range of duties you are expected to carry out within your job role. In a catering and hospitality environment, there is a chain of command where you lie within this chain will determine your accountability for the presentation and quality of food. So in terms of quality and presentation accountability, the following is an example. So if a kitchen manager or chef de cuisine, ordering quality produce and equipment, menu creation, managing of entire kitchen procedures, checking dishes before they are received by diners. For the sous chef, they are overseeing correct preparation, portioning and presentation. Training other staff members regarding quality and presentation. Area chefs ensuring correct preparation and cooking of the particular items, such as sauces, baked goods and chilled desserts. Commies could include the general preparation of garnishing, weighing of ingredients and etc. Apprentices, they're being trained on each station and are paying close attention to the quality procedures during initial preparation. An expediter are taking orders from servers correctly and allocating to the area chefs with consideration of when it needs to be served. Serving staff and dish washers, they, they are taking orders from diners correctly, ensuring dietary requirements and special requests are noted, ensuring dishes are thoroughly clean and dry for use during service. Alright, so adjustments to food may include the following. Ratio of wet to dry ingredients, the taste, the temperature, the texture, the thickness. Um, so getting the ratio of wet to dry ingredients correct is widely important to the success of a dish. Adhering to a standardized recipe and using correct calibrated scales and measuring tools will be drastically minimize the risk of ratios going awry. Taste. If the dish does not taste as, sh as should, it could be for a variety of reasons. This may include using spoiled produce, using the wrong ingredients, or not using the right amount of ingredients. Food that is too cold may be able to be reheated. So as long as it is um, noticed straight away, has not been um, partially eaten, and reheating will not affect the quality of the food. Dishes that are too warm, however, may not be easy to correct as too much heat when it is not wanted tends to affect food more drastically, such as ice cream melting. If the texture of the dish is not at its best, it could be because there is a, a component or accompaniment missing that adds variation. If you think this is the case, consult the sous chef or chef de cuisine. Alright, so define the scope of responsibility and identify your scope of responsibility for quality of food adjustments within your workplace. Alright, so if we're going back... So the scope of responsibility is the range of duties you are expected to carry out within your job role. In a catering and a hospitality environment, there is a chain of command 
where you lie within the chain will determine your accountability for the presentation and quality of the food. So essentially this is what the scope of responsibility is and where you are, you are an apprentice being trained okay so you'll be trained on each station where you'll have to pay close um, you know uh, close attention to the quality and procedures that are happening during the preparation during the cooking methods anything that is happening you know you need to you know pay close attention so you are at the apprentice level currently okay all right let's go forward All right. So number two, list the types of adjustments that may um, be made to food. So we could be making adjustments to the ratio of the wet to dry ingredients. We may be making adjustments to the taste, the temperature, the texture, the thickness, colors, and many, many other things. Okay. Um, we could also do presentation adjustments. We could do the quantity or the uh, so um, yeah how much quantity we are serving depending on what type of flavors we want to serve, as in too much of something can um, you know overshadow the other flavors or tastes in the dish as well. Okay, all right. So uh, complete that, and once you're done, come back and we can move on to the next one. So. Uh, unpause the video or the lecture when you're ready and we can move on all right so 5.1 portion desserts to maximize yield and profitability of food production the yield is the amount of produce uh, uh, by a given recipe or process um, so you know the yield is the amount you can produce um, you know when you've been given a recipe so usually they'll tell you okay this is for six or seven they have a recommendation for your serving okay in order to maximize the yield of um, the desserts you want to consider the quantities that you'll cook you want to pay um, attention during the cooking you you know storage the portion sizing the shape compared to the cooking vessel if it's you know big or small you don't want to be cooking it you want to be cooking it in the right equipment, not in something that's too big and you're only cooking a little bit of egg or dessert and it's really thin or thick because you've chosen the wrong equipment. Alright, maximizing profit. Uh, profit. Steps to maximize profit include frequently checking prices of ingredients to ensure you are getting the best deal considering the different types, brands and qualities of items trying to create a menu which follows seasonal produce using the same size serving spoons, ladles, etc. for allocating portions alright so explain the aspects of dessert creation that can affect yield so when we are looking at dessert creation we want to be looking at the quantities that we have cooked, we want to pay um, attention to the cooking process and take care. We want to make sure the storage is being done correctly and in the right places. We want to make sure that we're doing the correct portion sizing and the shape as well and serving them on the right um, dishware or cooking them in the right um, equipment. And what steps can we take to ensure maximum profit from desserts? So we want to be frequently checking the prices of ingredients. Um, we want to be making sure that um, we use the same size serving spoons, ladles or any allocating um, equipment that can give us um, consistent portioning. We want to get, um, you know, we want to create a menu that is seasonal so we can adjust and fit the uh, menu items within what is available and not having to pay extra to source something that is um, not seasonal. We also want to consider the different types of brands and qualities of items so if we find something cheaper but we're only maybe 10% away from something that's 20% more expensive the sacrifice there is a bit better than to buy the more expensive one but lose more money 
or in terms of making less profit you want to use whichever one is better for your pocket all right so complete those um, questions once you're done come back and unpause and we can move on to the next one all right 5.2 use accompaniments that balance and enhance taste and texture of desserts accompaniments to balance and enhance the taste and texture of desserts include ice creams and sorbets sauces and creams fruits biscuits and brittle so using your reading and wider work experience create a list of appropriate accompaniments for desserts so we want to be accompanying our desserts with ice cream sorbets sauces creams fruits biscuits brittles um, could be um, flowers you know edible flowers um, what else we could be doing uh, you know poached fruits um, yeah gelatos yeah, things, uh, so many things that could go, you know, we could do, do infused um, um, fruits, um, flambéed fruits, yeah, so many things. Alright, so complete that, come back um, and unpause the lecture and we can move on to the next one. So 5.3, select garnishes and decorations with flavours and textures that complement the desserts so garnishes and decorations for desserts include colored and flavored sugars fresh and preserved or crystallized fruits jellies shaved chocolates and chocolate decoration sprinkled icing sugar whole or crushed nuts sponge sugar so using your wider work experience create a list of garnishes so we could be talking about um, sugar spun such as you know candy um, can like candy floss or whole crushed nuts or roasted nuts or we could go candied nuts a sprinkle icing sugar shaved chocolate or ch uh, chocolate decorations fondant jellies um, crystallized fruits and colored and flavored sugars okay so complete that and return to the lecture when you're ready and we can move on to the next one so 5.4 plate desserts accompaniments and garnishes attractively with artistic flair appropriate for the occasion and the item so alternative tableware includes chopping boards slate tiles hanging skewers a uh, mini version of items, mason jars, shot glasses, coffee glasses, science equipment. When plating food, consider variations in height, uh, such as shape, size of items, color, texture, and the direction that is, um, it might be placed, or the design that you're going to incorporate to accompany the item. Ways to plate sauces could be lines, could be in foams, drops, in pools, um, pools, brushes. Um, you could also tape up and do splatters as well. Within a recipe, methods of garnishing may include drizzling, um, dolloping, sprinkling, uh, smearing. Alright, so now we want to get into Act 35D. Let's create a list of alternative tableware that we could be using to serve our desserts. So, we could be using chopping boards, science equipment, coffee glasses, shot glasses, mason jars, um, hanging skewers, slate tiles. There's so many varieties. Just get creative. Alright, so what aspects of serving desserts should be considered when plating? Um, you want to consider the arrangement, um, so the height, the shape, the size of the item, the color, texture, and the direction that you're placing the item in whichever way you might be pointing towards something. And you want to complement the design, so you don't want to put something that doesn't really go with it. All right, which artistic techniques can be employed to apply sources to plate? So in case of sources, we are talking about 
um, you know, doing lines or foaming them up and then placing them, uh, doing drops or pulls or using brushes to do lines or we could do splatters as well. Okay. Alright, so once you've completed those, come back and resume the lecture and we can move on to the next one. 5.5 Plate and decorate desserts for um, practicality of service and customer consumption. Tableware. When plating a dish, the vessel it is placed on is uh, very important in terms of practicality. There is such a vast array of tableware available and whilst this can mean dishes can be presented very creatively, this is a moot point if the food cannot be eaten and enjoyed with ease. So basically what they're trying to say is don't overcomplicate your presentation. Otherwise, ultimately if it looks good but you can't eat it, there's no point. Height and structure. Desserts should be plated in such a way that there is variation in height but that is not daunting to consume. If the number of items to be plated um, to complete a dessert are um, numerous then the plating of the dessert will be time consuming. You must consider how the plating will work if there are several of the same dish to plate and serve simultaneously. Alright, what considerations should we be uh, made when plating desserts um, for the practicality of service and consumption? Make reference to tableware, height and structure and provide examples where possible. So, when we are servicing or serving our dishes, we don't want to make them too complicated so customers can't enjoy them. We also want to make sure the height and the assembly complements each other so you don't want to have the dessert too flat you want to have a nice height to them you also don't want to overcrowd your plate so you don't want to put too many things you also want to pick the appropriate tableware so there's no uh, need to serve custard in a plate because you need a bowl so pick the right one okay um, if you're looking at the structure um, some desserts will hold its shape, others will not. So if you're going to serve it in a specific, um, a, you know, serving dish, but it doesn't hold the structure, you want to serve it in something that will allow it to hold that shape. So maybe in a shot glass, maybe in a dessert cup, whatever it might be. If you're also thinking, okay, um, ice creams, right? If it's too hot they don't hold its shape so they melt and become liquid but if they are frozen they hold a block shape depending on how you form it or in a round shape so you want to think about it in a way that it is presentable and enjoyable not just it's we get it that it is art but we don't want to get too consumed because ultimately our customers want to eat this item they just don't want to look at it Okay, alright, so complete that, when you're done, resume the video, and we can continue on to the next portion. So, 5.6, visually evaluate desserts and adjust presentation before serving. Whenever you are evaluating a dish, you should consider accompaniments and garnishes that maximize visual appeal. The balance, the color, the contrast. Um, plated food for practicality of customer consumption and service. There are five elements to the basic plating of food. Okay, so you want to plan, you want to have simplicity, you want to have balance, you want to have the correct portions, and you want to highlight your focal point. Okay. Ask yourself questions such as, does each dish look like the original way that you planned it? Are all the dishes uniform, meaning do they all look the same? If you have 10 plates um, on your bench of the same item, do they look the same or do they look different? And if they look different, why? Why do they look different? Why didn't they come out as you originally wanted them to? Is each person being served the same portion? Is there a balance of colors, flavors and textures? 
Does the palette look simple enough? Is the dessert still the main attraction of the dish, or is it being overtaken by the decorations? Would I be happy if I were served this as a customer myself? So if you're not happy, most likely the customer will not be. Adjusting presentation. The best approach to adjusting presentation is to place components on various plates and in different compositions to perfect the dish before it goes live. So live meaning before you decide on serving a dish, make sure you practice, make sure you go through different variations to see what looks good. You don't want to be making the decisions when your customer has ordered the food. You already want to know what you're going to serve. You already got want to know how it should look like before you put it on the menu. If the dish is missing a component, it is a simple fix. Add it to the plate. If the plating is not up to par or the portion size is wrong, then it will need to be replated on a clean um, plate or a crockery. So what are the five elements to plating a dish? So if we're talking about the five elements, we want to be planning, we want to be um, you know, having simplicity, we want to have equal balance, we want to have the correct portions, and we want to highlight our dessert and not the decorations. What questions may you ask yourself when visually evaluating a dish? So, when we're asking ourselves questions, we want to ask ourselves, would I be happy as a customer to eat that dessert? Is the dessert still the main attraction of the dish? Does the plate look simple enough? Is there a balance of colors, flavors, and textures? Is each person that, um, you know, each portion that we're being um, given out, do they look the same? You know, are they uniform? Or do they look different? And does each dish look like the original plan and the way we have planned it to look like? If it doesn't, why? All right, number three. What steps can be taken to adjust the presentation? So, for us to adjust presentation, we want to place components on various plates. We also want to practice. Okay, before we send out the dish, we want to have a final plan of what the dish should look like. If there are any missing components, we want to place it on the dish. And before it goes out, we want to make sure all components are on the dish. And if um, you've messed up somehow, we need to get a clean plate or crockery and then start replating um, because we don't want to send out a subpar product where the customer will not appreciate and become unhappy. Alright, so complete those. Once you've done that, come back, resume the lecture and we can move on to the next one. So 5.7. Display desserts with appropriate sauces and garnishes. Food safety of display desserts. Depending on the establishment, desserts may be displayed to the diners as well as or instead of um, listed within a menu. Any desserts that are displayed must be done so with careful considerations about food safety as well as the presentation of the desserts over a prolonged period of time. Desserts can be displayed in the following ways, in cabinets, trolleys, tables, and stands. In which ways can desserts be displayed? What factors should be considered when deciding on appropriate sources and garnishes for use in dessert displays? So, when we're displaying desserts, we can display them in cabinets, trolleys, or stands, but I would prefer to have them in cold storage where I can monitor the temperatures so such as a fridge or a display fridge with a clear glass display so that our customers can still see them but our product will not get spoiled and can be stored under the, um, the temperatures that it is required. So what factors should be considered when deciding on appropriate sources and garnishes for use mm -hmm. in dessert displays? We're looking at when we're considering, um, you know, things such as um, 
do the flavors go together we're also looking at does it balance out the presentation is it colorful enough or is it too colorful um, does it add to the texture or is it taking away from the dessert does it hold its structure or does it um, you know um, hurt the dessert in any way so if we're thinking about hot chocolate sauce and ice cream yes it's great um, that they go together they taste well but the hot chocolate sauce will start melting the um, ice cream so you don't want to place the two together but what you could do is have fresh strawberries or fruits and have the hot chocolate sauce and you can accompany them together because they won't necessarily damage each other but they complement each other okay so you want to find um, garnishes and sauces that complement the dessert not take away from it not steal the show okay so complete those when you're ready come back and resume the lecture and we can move on to the next part 5.8 store desserts in appropriate environmental conditions so when considering the correct storage of desserts there are a range of factors that must be considered these include atmosphere humidity light packaging temperature and use of containers and ventilation below are the optimum storage conditions for a range of desserts so if we're looking at unfrosted or undecorated cakes we want them to be wrapped in cling film and stored in a uh, at room temperature or in a refrigerator for two to three days or can be frozen for up to a month Cakes that are decorated with buttercream, ganache or fondant uh, need to be placed in a tub or keeper at, a, uh, at room temperature or refrigerator for three to four days. Um, note that the refrigerated fondant can cause colors to run. Um, cakes decorated with cream cheese or whipped cream, they need to be covered or refrigerated for up to three days. Cream cheese icing can be frozen but cream icing cannot cooked fruits pies crumbles and tarts wrapped and covered and stored at room temperature for up to 48 hours or in the fridge for up to seven days pies and tarts um, with meringue custard or creams we want to be contained and refrigerated up to two days All right so puff pastry desserts Unfilled pastries can be frozen in an airtight container for up to six weeks. Filled pastries are best consumed the day they are made. Ice creams and sorbets, you want to have them in an airtight container at the back or the bottom of the freezer. Creme brulee or um, creme caramels need to be covered and refrigerated for three to four days or consumed fresh. Um, uh, crepes you want to tightly wrap and stack in cling film then refrigerate for up to two days to refreeze place the parchment between each crepe before wrapping in cling film and freezing for souffles these can be stored in a refrigerator for two to three days before being baked off mousse and sabion you can store in the fridge for one to two days and a flan can be covered in plastic wrap in the baking tin and refrigerated for up to two days all right what factors need to be considered when storing desserts so we want to be considering the atmosphere the humidity light packaging temperature the container that we're going to put it in and the ventilation number two how can light affect food so light can um, decolor um, you know your item it can take the brightness away it can also um, in some cases if they are left um, exposed to light for too long um, items can become oxidized and essentially you know lose the nutrition value in the long run number three what affects the rate of photo degradation so so when you've got your items 
exposed to sunlight essentially they can um, degrade lose nutritional value um, it can change the chemical compounds and change the taste and the way it looks yeah, essentially taking away from what you want your dessert to look like and kind of changing it looking at making it look a bit flat and undesirable and sometimes changing the taste altogether what type of packaging and containers may be used for storing desserts so we in most cases we want to use non-toxic um, plastic containers dependent on um, what type of containers it would be we could use cling film parchment paper um, we could use pans that are at least coated with Teflon so that they don't rust in moist conditions we can use um, you know things such as aluminium um, you could also use things such as um, you know non-toxic um, cardboard it just depends on if it's got any chemicals that you don't want to leach onto or change the way your food tastes you also want to make sure that they're odor free so that those plastics or cardboards aluminium whatever that you're putting it in or um, doesn't you know share that smell with your dessert so now when your customer is going to eat that dessert it smells like plastic or aluminium or whatever it might be alright so complete those questions once you're done resume with the lecture and we can move on to the next one alright 5.9 clean work area and dispose or store surplus and reusable byproducts according to organizational procedures environmental considerations and cost reduction initiatives Effective cleaning of the work area should be completed in two distinctive stages, cleaning and sanitizing. When cleaning, use a detergent, water and vigorous scrubbing to remove visible dirt, grease and grime from the surfaces. Clean all surfaces, even those that do not come in contact with food. Sanitizing. The second stage is to sanitize surfaces same surfaces in order to um, using disinfectant to kill bacteria and prevent it from spreading the first stage must be done to make the second stage effective so if you don't clean with soap and warm or hot water and agitate all the dirt and grime sanitizing the workplace um, the bench will not really take any effect points to remember some sanitizing chemicals are toxic so must be rinsed from surfaces so in this case I would recommend you purchase food grade sanitizers and not commercial cleaning sanitizers because the food grade ones will be less toxic and if by accident do get consumed will not cause too much harm to you or customers other sanitizers are safe from um, food uh, and humans to come in contact the dilution of a sanitizer is central to its effectiveness so you don't want to put too much water as it will um, reduce the effectiveness they require time to work properly so you want to let them dry fully when you sanitize a bench or equipment and sanitizers can be made in diluted solutions and stored so long as they are labeled properly within the work area there should be bins with lids inside there should be large bins outside the premises waste should not be taken through eating areas organic waste should be used for compost recyclables should be separated from perishables and where possible offcuts and scraps of food should be used within the company to maximize profit and minimize waste reusing produce also reduces the environmental impact your company has as if less waste is going to the landfill Fewer greenhouse gases are being created and emitted into the Earth's atmosphere. So we go up to 5i. Identify two stages of effective cleaning and elaborate on each. So first we want to clean. So the first stage is cleaning, right? Cleaning it properly with detergent or soap. 
with a sponge and hot water, agitating all the grime and removing it all together, wiping it down. And then we're moving on to the sanitizing part, where we will um, have a, um, a diluted solution of sanitizer with water and spray down the, um, the bench and let it take its effect, maybe one to five minutes, depending on your area. Let it dry and kill that bacteria that is left on that bench. So we've got cleaning and agitating, and then number two is sanitizing. All right, so discuss the way in which waste should be disposed. So if we're disposing waste, first of all, we need to consider what sort of waste. If it is um, you know, able to be composted, we should have a compost bin where we can dispose of those food scraps. We should have bins that have lids. If we have large bins, they must be outside of the premises where it can be picked up by a collection agency. If we've got bins that need to be transported, we should not transport them through the, uh, the dining hall or where um, you know, customers are present. Um, if we are producing waste such as cardboard, glass, aluminium, plastics, we should separate them and uh, recycle them accordingly to the material and ultimately we should be trying to reduce our waste because two things it will help the environment and we will um, essentially lose less money in the business now number three discuss the ways in which produce can be reused to maximize profits and minimize the environment impact so if there are leftovers, we can try and reuse these items in a you know, more creative way or in a different item that is new. If we're thinking about throwing away things, um, you know, we want to think about how can we recycle them and instead of throwing them to the landfills so that less CO2 emissions are put out. We also need to think about what we're purchasing. We don't want to be purchasing too much compared to how much we're selling. We might think about reducing our portion sizes so that our customers don't consume um, over their limits or they're wasting too much food. We also don't want to be giving takeaway boxes so um, you know that we're producing too many plastics or any containers that we don't need to. We can also try and use recycled containers or um, equipment um, second-hand equipment, anything like that to reduce new production of uh, materials as well. Okay, so complete those as this is your last activity. I am sure that you will have finished your learner workbook by now, so I suggest you submit that to your trainer. If there are any issues, they will let you know um, of any sections that you might not have done correctly, but otherwise I hope that you have done them all. At this point, if you've got any questions or need to revise any sections, I recommend that you redo or revise any sections in this lecture or in your learner guide. If you're all good to go, then I recommend completing your multiple choice, which is online and made available. So if you have any feedback, any questions, don't hesitate to email me. My email is admin at wisemaneducation.com.au. Um, if you have any questions and you see me, don't hesitate to ask me. I'll try and guide you to the best of my ability. So after this, you'll have three in-class assessments, which is the knowledge um, assessment, skill and performance. And your trainers will guide you accordingly. So follow their instructions and hopefully I'll see you on the other side. Alright, so um, yeah, hopefully you guys have a good one.